Good morning and welcome DCC to another online worship time together at Disbury Community Church and welcome to, to anyone else as well who uh, who maybe we've not met before face to face but has been tuning in to any of our videos. Uh, I do ask that if, if you have been tuning in just send us an email we'd love to, to get to know you uh, and, and catch up and, and see who you are see how you're getting on uh, that would be fantastic to be able to connect with you guys as well. We're going to continue this morning in our series Summer in the Psalms Becky Corner will be sharing what God's been speaking to her about a well-known psalm, Psalm 23, this morning. Uh, but before we get to that and before we get to uh, a couple of songs for some song worship time together, I'm just going to pray for us and our time with one another this morning. Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you in adoration of who you are. A glorious, mighty, powerful, loving, gracious, merciful and close God. I pray that this morning we would feel that closeness um, as individuals and as a unit as well Lord. I pray that you would bind us together through the power of your spirit, that you would prepare us well to hear your word as we, as we learn about you from this Psalm 23, as we learn how to communicate and how to, how to pray and, and, and how to focus our attention towards you and focus our trust in the God who sustains us and shepherds us. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom, for your care, your love, your tender touch in our lives that shepherds us along the way. I pray that we would all feel that this morning. I pray that we would feel the unity of your church, even though we worship from separate homes in separate spaces, Lord, I pray that your your spirit would do something amazing in bringing us together. We praise you, Lord, for the God that you are, the God that we cannot fathom or describe, but the God that we experience. And so I thank you for that, Lord. We pray all this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen.
blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Today's reading is found in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows, he leads me beside peaceful streams, he renews my strength, he guides me along right paths, bringing honour to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me, in the presence of my enemies. You honour me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Good morning, Didsbury Community Church, and welcome to another week of the Summer in Psalms. 
and for anybody else who is joining with us for the first time, my name is Becky. Um, welcome to our talk this morning. If you want to know anything more about Didsbury Community Church or you'd like to get involved in one of our Skype groups after, uh, please do get in touch and we can sort you out with that. I um, also thank you this morning uh, for Lauren for reading today's passage. I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with Psalm 23. In fact, when uh, Mick and I first read the preaching, preaching rota, he said to me, Oh, Becky, you got the easy one. And then he said to me, How do you preach on perfection? And I was like, Great, Mick. Uh, thanks for the wise words and the help there, just adding on the pressure. Um, but actually, uh, when reflecting on this psalm, what Mick had said is really very true. In many ways, this psalm is quite an easy one. Its message is quite simple. Um, for those of us who believe it, it's pretty much perfect. And it's all summed up in the opening line in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. My desire this morning is to talk through this whole passage, all through this lens of what it means to lack nothing. Now, for me, there's never really been too many occasions in my life where I've needed anything. Um, growing up, I was also very fortunate that my parents both worked, were able to provide for me. I had education, good healthcare. Ever since I was about 15, I was able to work. I had a job so I could fund my lifestyle. Um, however, there was on one occasion. It was after my first year at NTC. It was a year that I was only working seasonal, so just at Christmas and at holidays. And I hadn't really got much saved up, but during that summer, I wanted to do Camp America. And for those of you who are familiar with Camp America, um, the way they run is you have to pay to go out there. And then when you're out there, they give you some money and you kind of end up breaking even. Um, now, for those of you that know me, when I travel, I'm very much a once in a lifetime kind of experience sort of person. And so whilst I was out there, I ended up spending quite a lot more than I'd planned on trips and experiences with the people that I'd met there. And I had this incredible time. Um, but when I came back to the UK and had a look at my finances, um, I realised that I'd spent more than I planned and I wasn't going to be able to afford to pay all the rent that I needed to, as well as pay the fees for, for uni, and even with my student loan. And it was the first time that I've ever really felt anxious about money and was kind of lying in bed at night, like concerned about how I was going to pay for it and praying that I would find a job soon and, and really like saying to God, like, what am I going to do? And now fortunately, I was able to find some work and I was able to sort all that out. But um, before I did, I can tell you right now that I did not feel at peace internally. Um, money worries are stressful. I felt anxious. Um, I couldn't afford to, to continue my life here. But according to this psalm, I didn't really need to be anxious and stressed. Yes, even though my bank account lacked the money that I needed. As a believer, I lack nothing. So that's what I to want to talk about this morning. How is it possible to lack nothing? Masses of people in the world do. They lack basic things. Food, water, healthcare, security. How does this, apply, this psalm apply to them? Well, when David says that he lacks nothing, he's gone beyond the physical needs of the human. He's addressing here the inner, the spiritual, about inner peace and contentment how God's grace is sufficient for him, totally and utterly sufficient for him. So how do we get to that place? Our inner selves, not desiring anything more, being content with God. Someone at college once recommended that I try reading this psalm backwards. So here we go. The first line reads, I have everything because the Lord is my shepherd. When we know who our shepherd is and what this means, when we see God for who he is in comparison to the rest of the world, we can know and be assured that we really do lack nothing. Psalm 23 takes us on a journey. David, who we're told is the author, paints a picture of a life in relationship with God, how we were made to live and thrive as believers. How we can feel restful and at peace in the busyness of life how we can always have a sense of purpose and direction, how we can make the right decisions in a world of temptations and distractions and have hope in the middle of our darkest moments. This all seems quite idealistic, but if the Lord really is our shepherd, 
and this is true, then we can have this deep, deep contentment, knowing we have everything because we have God. Now, imagery is really important in this psalm. Um, David paints us a picture of the shepherd and the sheep. David himself had been a shepherd and, and knew what the job entailed. And he knew what the needs of the sheep were and he knew the job description of being a shepherd. Now this picture is really quite a special one. Um, I'd describe it as almost timeless because we're all able to grasp what it means. I'm pretty sure none of us at DCC are sheep farmers. Yet this is a biblical picture that we're all quite familiar with. The psalmist here is comparing himself to a creature that is, is quite weak and defenceless and prone to wander. And here the good shepherd is one who leads and protects and provides. He is everything to those sheep. Those animals are fully dependent. It's not like this two-way relationship. The sheep aren't beasts of burden who serve the shepherd like a horse or an ox might be able to. The shepherd is their all. And furthermore, something that I've found to be really quite beautiful is actually that the sheep isn't just some random wild animal. It's an object of property. It has an owner. It belongs to someone who has bought it at a price. They care for it and it has value. In this psalm, David knows that he belongs to the Lord. There is confidence and intimacy in this opening line. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my all. Therefore, I don't need anything else. I don't lack anything else. So this morning, I want to walk through this psalm in light of this first verse. How can we belong to God? And how to can we find our souls fulfilled? So let's start with verse two. The Lord is my shepherd. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Life is busy and crazy and very often the opposite of peaceful. I think we can all understand that. But we're able to find peace and rest because of the promises we have from God. From those that are throughout scripture and also those that we've heard from God in our own quiet times. There is no situation in our lives that is too crazy and too busy that God's peace is unable to overwhelm. But not only do we find rest and and can find peace in these promises in specific moments in our lives. But David talks about how we can walk through life with them. He leads me beside peaceful streams. David here understands that the rest that our souls desire is not just for the moments, but for daily life. And we need to be led, because like sheep, we can easily wander and forget and get distracted. Now many of us have been raised in a church, and know about the grass and the streams. We know about what the Bible says about the promises of God, but do we deeply know them and live by them? See, sheep can survive by eating dry grass, but they prosper from eating the greenest grass. We were made for more than just reading the promises in the Bible, but to thrive and to live into these promises. For those of you that know me, you know, one of my favourite promises that I've clung to in my life is Romans 8, 28, that God promises to work good through all of those who love him. When I was unwell and had to leave a uni and bath, I didn't have a job, I didn't have any friends around, my mental health was poor and I didn't have much hope in the situation. But I grabbed onto this promise that God was going to work it for his good. And that was hard to see at the time. There would be nights where I'd go to bed and I'd pray over this promise and be like, God, yeah, I'm ready for tomorrow to be better. And then I'd wake up and the first thing that I would do in the morning would be um, to eat my breakfast and I would make myself sick. And I thought I was going backwards. And in those moments, I was faced with a decision. I could either give up and let that promise just become words on a page, or I could press into them and believe that God would one day use it for his glory. And in those moments, I chose to cling and I trusted. And I was able to live that year of my life with an inner peace that one day it would work out. And here I am, thanks be to God, living on the other side of that promise. The Lord was my shepherd in that moment. And I lacked nothing because I felt rest in a messy part of my life because I trusted that God would fulfill his promise to work it for his good. And if the Lord is your shepherd, you can too. 
let's move to verse three. The Lord is my shepherd. He renews my strength and he guides me along right paths, bringing honour to his name. David here talks about being guided along the right paths with the purpose of bringing honour to God. It's so easy in life to get caught up in the world with this narrative of ambition, of achievement, of comparison to others. You might find yourself in seasons of being unemployed or unwell and not feeling like you're living up to the calling that God has placed on your life. And this is where feelings of discontentment or a lack of purpose can really do damage to your soul and to your mental health. However, it's clear in this psalm that for every step in the journey of your life, for every season that a believer has, there is intent there and there is purpose. And that is to bring honour to God and that is enough. It might not be exciting and it might not be glamorous or what you thought you would be doing, but you have purpose and value. And that is to glorify God, to love him and to love others. No matter what the world says, that is what is required of you. You lack nothing because your whole life has meaning. You might say, well, that sounds great. I have peace and I have purpose, but what about when everything around me falls apart? Verse four, the Lord is my shepherd, because even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me and they protect me. This verse is a reminder that in life, we are going to experience trying and testing times. They shouldn't be a shock or a surprise to us, but it's about how we go through them. In some translations and the version that I grew up with, this verse says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When Jesus died and rose again, death was defeated. And when we accept that, so too has the eternal death been removed. We no longer walk in the valley of death. It's only a shadow. So when we go through our darkest times, we can still say that we lack nothing because we walk with the one who can get us through those times. And we can have an assurance that although we may experience things that are really painful, it's not the end of the story. And that one day we will come out of that valley and that shadow and everything will be exposed to the light. A place where there is no more shadows or mourning or crying. Now I've never lived this verse out um, so clearly than with some close family friends. Um, there are a couple named Laura and George um, who themselves and their wider family have been part of um, my home church um, for my whole life. Um, and at this point um, in the story that I wanna tell was about 10 years ago. Um, Laura and George had two young and beautiful children, Ella and Daniel. Um, Ella was, I think, about five or six and Daniel was 18 months old. Now, I remember um, at the time being on holiday in France and I received a text from a friend saying, um, can you pray for Daniel? He's gone into hospital. We didn't know all the details. Um, but as the next few days progressed, we heard more from the family and, and we came home. And we're pretty close with these guys. And so literally as soon as we got off the ferry and drove home, my parents didn't even stop to unpack the car. They dropped us off, um, me and my brothers with my grandparents, and they went straight to Alder Hill Hospital to be with the family. Now, Daniel um, was only 18 months old when this tragic accident happened. And what had happened was um, he'd been put to bed upstairs and was fast asleep. And downstairs, his parents, Laura and George, um, were with um, the grandparents and a few friends were over and they were just having some food, having a nice time together. And um, it's quite a spacious house and they were all just socialising. But Daniel, um, he'd woken up and he'd managed to get out of his bed unnoticed. And he'd managed to get downstairs and go outside into the back garden where the family had a pond. And he fell in and obviously at that age he was unable to swim. Um, now, I believe that one of um, the friends spotted Daniel and he was rushed into hospital and put on a life support machine. It's a really, really tragic accident. And my family went to, to join theirs at the point that they'd been told that Daniel's brain was no longer active and actually that they needed to make the decision to turn off the life support machine. My mum and dad recalled to me that at that time in the hospital, when his little machine was being switched off, they're all in this room together. 
Daniel's granddad had him held in his arms and they were all singing songs of worship together and praying. That they felt that the Holy Spirit was tangibly there with them as Daniel took his last breath. There was peace in that room and there was love and there was worship. This family were in a dark, dark valley and one I'm probably sure you never come out of as a grieving parent. Experiencing the loss of a young and beautiful child in such a tragic way. But they didn't walk through that valley alone. They walked and continue to walk through that valley, clinging onto Jesus. And they knew that it wasn't the valley of death, but its shadow. Because although Daniel isn't here with us physically anymore, we all have that hope and that assurance that he is now beyond death. He's with Jesus and that that family will be reunited one day. That hope is everything. Verse 5. The Lord is my shepherd because he prepares a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. He honours me by anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows with blessings. Now, I personally have never really had what you describe as an enemy. I've kind of gone through school getting on well with people, got on well with people at work. So sometimes I find it difficult to visualise or understand the, the relevance of these passages that talk about enemy, enemies because I can't imagine it. But I've now come to realise that an enemy might just be a bit more than a person. The Bible refers to the world as an enemy. Now, not the, the plants and the rocks and the trees and stuff, but the things that are against God. So I got to thinking, well, what about the enemy of unjust economic systems whereby the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? Or the enemy of mindless consumerism at the expense of many people in the natural world? Or the enemy of corrupt governments and greedy businesses? When I look at the world and its mess, it seems so overwhelming that there's too many problems to resolve. But here the passage says, a feast is set before us set apart from those enemies. They will not last. They will not be part of the feast. Only God's righteousness will. And this brings me, me pleasure and hope to know that even though these issues seem so big and so out of my depth, that God has it under control. And actually we are to join with God in that action. Because what's interesting about verse five and verse six is a, a slight change in imagery. The shepherd and the sheep changes. See, a sheep can't eat at a table, nor can it drink from a cup. And this alludes to the way that we were made. Yes, to be totally dependent on God. We know that we're prone, prone to wander and need guidance. But this isn't the full picture. We were made to have a higher and more meaningful relationship with him. Not just as sheep, but as human beings who are made in his image and who are able to sit at a table and drink from a cup. We can make decisions, we can participate in battles against the enemy, we can converse with God. We're not just aimless robots. We're not just the same as every other sheep in the flock, but are individuals before God. And we can do this, we can battle with the enemy and go through life with an overflowing cup. God will give us the strength, the rest, the peace, the confidence we need and more because he is a generous God. He is a good shepherd. So finally, verse six. The Lord is my shepherd. His goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all of the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Now the Hebrew verb for follow actually means to, to chase. Um, and this psalm ends with an assurance that God's love pursues and chases us right to where we are now. Does that not bring you so much security? After all you've done in your life, after all the mistakes you've made countless times, he's always chased you and will continue to do so for all the days of your life. When this earthly life is done, we can be secure that we get to spend eternity in God's very own home. He wants to dwell with us. You lack nothing today because when you look at the bigger picture of eternity you can be secure in the fact that the one who made everything chases after you with his love and desires to be in a relationship with you forever. 
you're a special part of his flock. Like Mick said, the message of this psalm is perfect and it is simple. If the Lord is your shepherd, you can live your life lacking nothing in your inner soul, even if the things around you are in turmoil. You can have inner peace and rest. You can know that you have a purpose in this life, that you can have hope in the darkest moments that the light is coming. You can know that you are eternally loved and secure. And when you know these things, not just read them, but know them and pray them and meditate on them, you deeply know them every day. You can walk through life with a confidence and a peace and a fearlessness. Won't that change the way that you do life? Thanks be to God. Now guys, I've just got a few questions um, for you to discuss in your Skype groups. Question number one, um, same as usual, what stood out from today's scripture or talk? Question number two, have there been any other times in your life that this psalm has spoken to you in a particularly meaningful way? Question number three, are there any, uh, any areas of your life that you currently feel like you do lack in? And if yes, how would applying this psalm change that? I hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you guys soon.